I do want to just introduce our two speakers uh, for everybody here. Um, and they're two of my favorite, most favorite people in the world. So it's really kind of exciting to be able to uh, present them. So Bjorn Westerholt uh, is one of is a senior medical education research fellow here at the University of Washington. Uh, he completed not only his residency, but also his chief residency here. Flora Welsh is an assistant professor at uh, Boston University School of Medicine, and she is currently the assistant clerkship director and assistant program director at Boston Medical Center, because you know one of those jobs is enough. Uh, she did a residency and chief residency at Mass General Harvard affiliated residency program and completed the medical education research fellowship here at the University of Washington. So I'm extremely pleased to introduce both of them. Uh, they're both wonderful speakers and wonderful people. So I'm going to turn over the uh, venue to them. Hey. Put my camera down here real quick. <laughs> um, and so, this, so this is curriculum 102. Thank you, Fiona. I am Laura Welsh and Bjorn. I'm Bjorn. Hi there. And so as this is curriculum 102, our hope is that this serves as a complement to what was discussed in curriculum 101. There, Jessica Smith and Moshe Weisberg gave some really great tips on how to design and create an engaging resident conference and adapt the curriculum as a whole. For 102, we're going to hone in and discuss curriculum development on a more granular level. Actually, my slide is already not working. On a more granular level. So the term curriculum, at its most basic, is a planned educational experience, but it covers a breadth of educational experiences. It can be the total experience that students have in an educational setting, i.e. the entire residency experience, or it can be used to discuss the content contained on a single course or data didactics. For many of us, we are tasked with these smaller curricula. As an academic clinician, you will at some point be asked to develop a lecture, workshop, or other educational session. We want to give you the tools to do this well. So in Curriculum 101, Motion Jessica covered a similar framework. They discussed how to improve the residency curriculum and the idea of the 10,000 foot view, your larger overarching curriculum, and down to the ground floor of basic planning, the data data experience. Our goal for the next 40 minutes or so is to focus in on that ground floor and go through the blueprints to that floor plan. More specifically, we want to provide a stepwise approach on how to design a curriculum with some practical tips, and then briefly, highlight ways to leverage your time, make it count twice, and turn your curricula into a scholarly project. So first, why do we even care about curriculum development? Do I really need to be so formal? Is informality just the enemy of creativity and self-direction? I would argue no, that actually a career plan and structure supports creativity and allows your students to be self-directed. Often, when we discuss great educators, there's this assumption that some people are just naturally talented. And while that may be true, we tend to overlook or discount the hours of planning and preparation that go into teaching and make these people and their teaching seem so effortless. An effective curriculum provides students, teachers, and administrators, stakeholders with a measurable plan and structure for delivering a quality education. The bigger the deliverable planned, the more planning and design is needed. Like you mentioned, a curriculum is just your plan for the educational experience. It provides a structured guide that asks, who are your learners? What do you want them to be able to do after your educational intervention? How are you going to create this transformation? And most importantly, this does not exist in a vacuum. It takes into account all the contextual factors of your unique learning environment. Not only does your curriculum provide the mission statement and keep you organized, it also provides a framework so you can plan and anticipate potential issues before they even happen. And by investing this time up front, you can save yourself a lot of headaches later when things don't go to plan. There are many theories and frameworks for how to develop and design a curriculum, but sorry, but the most the prevailing framework and the one most common in medical education is currents. The currents model for curriculum development is a foundation that many of us have been taught in medical education. And it provides a nice structure to think about curriculum design. It has six steps, problem ID, targeted needs assessment, developing goals and objectives, developing an educational strategy, implementing your strategy, evaluating your curriculum, and then feeding forward into the problem ID. This is presented in a circle 
because it's very much is a circular iterative process. But just as important as each individual step are the lines in between. All every step informs every other step. So while your target needs assessment informs your goals, it also informs what educational strategy you're going to use and how you're going to implement that and well how you're going to evaluate your curriculum. So what Bjorn and I want to do is go step by step through the current model and discuss each step in detail. Before we do though, um, there's a lot you could talk about in curriculum development and Kurzweil in particular. And so if you want anything in more detail, we recommend this book of which Dr. Kern himself is one of the authors. Um, and it goes a lot more into the developmental details that we're gonna have to gloss over here today. And also, before we start, we want to set the stage. Curriculum development can be very abstract and kind of dry. So as we go through this model, we want to tie in a practical example to give this framework more relevance. So as we move along, we want you to imagine that you are a faculty member who's been asked by your chair to conduct a faculty development workshop on the placement of ultrasound guide IVs. You now have to go forward and create curriculum for the session. So now Bjorn. Thanks. I'm on the same slide as you are. So problem identification and needs assessment are the big picture ideas that are going to ground your curriculum. We start with problem identification because a clear statement of the problem to be addressed is necessary to understand the outcomes we hope to achieve with our curriculum. This includes identifying whom is affected, patients, providers, or society as a whole, and in what way through patient outcomes, quality of care, quality of life, satisfaction, costs, or et cetera. It can be helpful to draw from existing literature for epidemiologic data, or you may turn to lo local resources for a sense of the scope and the impact of the problem. I want to cut away, though, to a different model for a moment to highlight the connection between problem identification and outcomes. The Kirkpatrick model describes four areas for evaluation of a curriculum. It can be helpful early on to consider the outcomes being measured as a way to ensure that your problem is adequately defined. A clearly defined problem should suggest meaningful, measurable outcomes and will support your next steps in planning a curriculum to reach those outcomes. Kirkpatrick's model was developed to justify the costs associated with training by defining levels of impact of training. The four levels in the Kirkpatrick model are reactions, which includes learner satisfaction, engagement, and relevance, Learning, including measurements of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and more recently, confidence and commitment. Behaviors, including individual behavioral change and systems measures to support that change. And results, which might be patient or learner, outcome, or learner outcomes or leading indicators of those outcomes. You've probably previously seen these arranged in a pyramid. And that pyramid model was useful in that it showed a foundation of reactions supporting learning, which then supported behavioral change to achieve results. That's been more recently laid out as a continuum to reduce that hierarchical structure. And that's in part to allow for publication of work that investigates change in each of these areas rather than diminish the importance of some compared to others. So for our hypothetical workshop, we could define this as a, this problem in a number of ways, which would in turn influence how we later measure the impact of our curriculum. A patient-oriented problem might be that your department is seeing increasing rates of patients with difficult vascular access, in which case our training could be connected to possible outcome measures such as time to IV access, time to pain medications or antibiotics, number of sticks, line infections, or length of stay. But a provider or learner-oriented outcome might come from a change in your department. Say you're trying to improve billing of ultrasound procedures, and so faculty supervision is being more closely monitored. But if you have faculty members that note that they're not comfortable supervising some procedures, we might create a curriculum to improve willingness to use ultrasound, technical proficiency, rates of ultrasound-guided peripheral IVs, or resident assessment of the availability and quality of supervision as potential outcomes. And so we use this problem uh, to move on to our general needs assessment, and that is that not all faculty are ultrasound trained for supervision of resident procedures in the emergency department. The general needs assessment asks how your problem is currently addressed in the world in general and how it should be solved ideally. 
This information can be gleaned from existing resources and curricula that you might identify through a literature search on MedEd portal or in other shared repositories. You might find this through expert consultation, or it may require a new needs assessment to characterize current processes. And that would be an academic endeavor and it's publishable itself. It's important to know what both patients, medical professionals, educators, and even society are doing about the problem in its current state, as well as to understand the current context of the problem. What factors predispose, enable, or reinforce the problem among each of these groups? After describing what is being done, curriculum developers can then, then continue their search of existing resources and literature. You might look at professional society recommendations or clinical practice guidelines to try and identify, is there a current best practice that we can use as an appropriate target for our ideal solution, given our current knowledge? Since this curriculum can be designed for patients or providers or educators, and or might strive to educate society in general, that ideal solution should reflect the desired actions on behalf of that group. The curriculum might even be forward thinking and intended to shape or influence behaviors that won't come about until much farther in the future. So for our case, we might wanna look at articles describing variability and ultrasound training among practicing physicians and residents, or to programs targeting competency and ultrasound and guidelines for competence, and perhaps also to guidelines for supervision of residents performing procedures. That'll then take us into our targeted needs assessment. And this looks at our problem in a local context. How does your institution currently address the problem? And how does the institutional environment influence that effort? Another way of saying this is that your targeted needs assessment is intended to connect your general assessment to your consumers. And for example, Apple's success in developing new products, such as the iMac, the iPod and the iPhone may in part be due to a specific focus on consumers that includes both a general and targeted needs assessment. Broadly, each of these products took steps to redesign the consumer experience of computing, listening to and buying music on the iPod, and then again, both the way we use computers and the means we use to communicate with the advent of the iPhone and concurrent with social media. Each of these products compared the way other products worked in that time and how they might ideally work, but they also required an understanding of how consumers at the time used technology and had to demonstrate to consumers a transition or how that technology could change and would change their interaction to reach a new solution. And so for our curriculum, we'll ask, who are our learners? We want to know what they've already learned, how they've been trained in the past, and what are their current skills. And we also want to know what are their current self-perceptions. Do they think they need more training? Do they think they need different or new skills? In looking at their current training, we want to consider what is our existing curriculum, assuming that one exists, and what measures of efficacy have been made of this curriculum, because that might target already where we should uh, develop a new curriculum or improve upon that curriculum. We also want to know what environmental factors are at play. What resources are being allocated to the curriculum? What might be available to be allocated? Have there been in the past time or money limitations? Uh, or, you know, if there are not existing curricula locally, are there good available curricula elsewhere that can be adapted? We also have to consider stakeholder needs. Uh, are there staff needs, course directors, clerkship directors, or accrediting bodies that uh, need to be satisfied by the outcomes of our curriculum? So in addition to knowing what information we need to gather, we also have to consider where is this information coming from? And so there's several possible methods that are listed here, and those include informal and formal interviews, focus groups and observation, uh, meetings with your learners or educators or other stakeholders. The needs and assessment should be informed by past evaluations and iterations of your curriculum. Were learners dissatisfied with a prior session? Were there environmental barriers uh, that prevented you from doing things as you might want to have done them? And there are also numerous resources out there to support you in developing interview guides and surveys uh, to support the validity of the information that you're collecting on your learners. In any case, the extent of information and validity evidence that you're going to collect will depend on how much time and effort is available to collect it. 
Most likely, the scope and the extent of the curriculum or changes being made will be proportional to the evidence collected to support it. Take a quick break here just to save you some time. If there are relevant resources, by all means adapt them. Don't feel that you have to reinvent the wheel unless you have to reinvent the wheel and the curriculum simply doesn't exist. We've mentioned already other repositories and I'll mention again MedEd Portal, but curricula are also published in journals. You might have colleagues or friends or other programs that have good curricula. And honestly, now I see left and right people posting on Twitter and social media different ways that they're teaching things. There are even now, um, uh, you know, the post-it pearls and other phenomena that really only exist on social media. And so when looking at these outside sources of information, your targeted needs assessment then will help guide you in tailoring someone else's curriculum to your program's needs. And so for our hypothetical curriculum, we might plan on doing informal surveys of our faculty, but we could also consider written surveys or observed measures of supervision. We might consult our ultrasound faculty or continuing education curricula or other sources for content. And we'd want to look at how much time do we have available to train our faculty, what equipment or IT needs we might have, do we have space to do a large scale training or does this have to happen in a lot of piecemeal kind of uh, lessons. And then we'll also want to consider other stakeholders. Should this curriculum focus only on faculty competence and comfort or should it also include supervisory skills, knowing that that's going to be a different set of goals and objectives and might significantly complicate what we're trying to do. Okay, great. So we've mentioned the idea that you need a problem ID. You need to know the big picture of why you're doing this. And then you need to focus on your target needs assessment. What are the needs of all your stakeholders and what barriers may, be, may there be to implementation? Next, we have to focus on goals and objectives. This is where you ask, what am I trying to accomplish and what do my learners need to be able to do in order to accomplish this? The first question is your goal. It, again, is a big picture, overarching plan for your educational session as informed by your problem ID. And this helps dictate the objectives that you choose. Your objectives are explicit things that a learner would need to accomplish in order to accomplish this goal. This is your plan. It goes without saying that no collection objective fully captures all the learning that can occur. There is, after all, an implicit and a hidden curriculum, but these provide a framework for your educational session. These objectives are important because they help communicate to others where you're going and how you're going to get there. Your objectives are what you refer back to when you assess your learners and evaluate your curriculum to see if it's effective. So you need to be explicit in how you want to define them so you can be clear in how you measure them. And so there are three things I want to focus on about writing quality objectives. To do quality objectives, you need to focus on three things, which are, are they smart? Which domain are you targeting? And which level of expertise? So first, you need to be smart. A good learning objective is clearly described, easy to understand, and appropriate given the context. They need to tell you who will do how much or how well of what by when. The helpful mnemonic for this is a smart rule. We can ask yourself, is my objective, one, specific, i.e., what are the learners supposed to achieve? Two, measurable. What is a quantity, degree, or level of mastery that is expected? Third, achievable. Can the objectives actually be accomplished? With that in mind, four, realistic. Are the resources available to accomplish these objectives? And finally, timely. What time frame do you, have you set for achieving the objectives as specified? Sometimes you may see people write such verbs as know and understand when writing their objectives. But how does one truly assess knowing and understanding? These are nebulous words. Using action verbs such as explain and demonstrate are better because they are both measurable and specific. So once you have kind of thought about your specific and your smart objectives, you also need to think about what cognitive domains you're, tar you're targeting. Objectives can fit into different domains, three of which are cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. The cognitive domain being the factual knowledge and problem solving you may want your learner to undergo. Affective is attitudes, values, and beliefs and psychomotor is skills or behavioral objectives. 
depending on your overarching goal, you need to, may, may need to write objectives from any combination of these. Say you're teaching a procedure. You may need your learners to name the indications for that procedure, a cognitive goal. You may want them to successfully demonstrate that procedure, a psychomotor skill. And you may also want them to value the patient's privacy and comfort during that procedure, which would be an effective domain. And so once you've kind of thought about your SMART objectives, kind of pick the domain, you also want to think about the range of complexity that exists. What level of expertise do you want your learners to accomplish? And this is where I want to bring in the idea of Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy is a hierarchical model that can be used to classify educational learning objectives into levels of complexity and specificity. This can help you determine what level of expertise within each domain you want your learners to demonstrate. The use of a higher order or higher up in this pyramid objective is not necessarily better. It, the objective you choose needs to match the goals and the developmental stage of your learner. So early on in an anatomy course, you may just want your learner to be able to recall and name certain anatomical structures like the cranial nerves. And then later, you may want them to apply it to actually think about a facial palsy. There's a Bloom's taxonomy for all three domains. So first would be the cognitive domain. The most basic, at there, the most basic level is remembering, where your learners may be asked to define, label, or match. The highest level in this order is creating, where your learner may be asked to generate, devise, or combine. And the psychometer objectives ranges from perception, the ability to use sensory clues to guide motor activity, with verbs such as detects and distinguishes, to originating, the learner builds upon new movement patterns and it's often written with verbs, so just combines and composes. And third, the effective domain, which ranges from receiving to characterizing. In receiving, a student is passively paying attention. In characterizing, the student at this level tries to build on abstract knowledge. For all three of those domains, Bloom's taxonomy, there exists multiple resources online. There's an easy Google search you can do and get lists of verbs for each of these domains and higher for level that can help you build your objectives. So again, to summarize, you want your learners to think about their SMART objectives, think about which domain you're covering and which level of expertise. The final two points I wanna make about objectives are one, as often as the case, there are a mix of learners usually in our didactic sessions. You need to consider if you need to make separate objectives for different learner levels, which you may have to do. And third, objectives can be written for not only the individual learner, but also your learners as an aggregate, what will the whole class be able to do, and your educational program as an aggregate. And so for our faculty development session, our overall goal is that EM faculty members will be able to successfully, independently use also guide IDs. And objectives are at the end of this workshop, faculty and attendees will be able to list all the supplies they need to place an ultrasound guide ID, distinguish between the vein and an artery and ultrasound, and demonstrate the successful placement of offsetting guide ID. The first objective is more cognitive in a lower order, and the second two are more psychomotor of two different orders. Okay. So once we know what our, we want our learners to accomplish, now we get to the part that gets the most attention, the educational strategies. This is the fun stuff. The educational strategies are the content you're delivering and the methods by which the content is addressed. Though this is the fun and exciting, all the stuff you did before this, all the pre-work is really important to make educational strategies successful. Selecting the optimal educational strategy depends on what you want to accomplish. It also depends on the resources available to you that you've identified in your needs assessment. The selection of your educational strategy stems from your objectives and the domain you have selected, and it's filtered through the lens of the skill level that you are targeting. So if your objective is something from the cognitive domain, you consider any of the strategies listed here. It may be readings, lectures, discussions, team-based learning, peer teaching. If you want your learners just to recall facts, maybe readings are great. However, if you want them to apply these skills, maybe problem-based learning would be better. For psychomotor, you can select super, uh, direct clinical supervised experience, simulation, or review or skills. This is one of the domains that's more affected by your resources available because we all know standardized patients and simulation can be a little more expensive. So maybe role playing or role modeling is better for you here. And finally, for the effective domain, you consider anything 
from readings, experiences, reflectives, or facilitate discussions. So for our faculty development course, what we want to do is one, for our cognitive domain, we want our learners to watch a video before coming in that shows the basic process of placing an ultrasound guide IV. And then for our psychomotor domains, we're going to have them do a supervised clinical experience where they actually take the ultrasound to a live model and look at a live vein and ultrasound and distinguish between the two, and then move to a simulation with our model to actually practice placing ultrasound guide IV. Okay, so we're nearing the end. We're now on step five, implementation. This step is how, once you decided what we're going to teach and how we're going to teach it, implementation is where we actually do it. This is how you take your plan and enact it. This is the most intuitive of all the steps. And I'm not going to go into much detail here about it, but I do want to focus on two things. This is where you really want to rely on strong administrative mechanisms and get your administrators involved early. They can be a great resource to ensure success, successful implementation. You may want to do small groups, but your administrator might be the one that knows that you need to book out small group rooms a year in advance. So really work with them early in the process. And the second is pilot testing. This can be early pilot testing can help identify any implementation issues and help you refine your plan so that your final day of implementation is successful. So things to think about implementation for our faculty development course. We may want to email reminders to the faculty who are involved in teaching and the faculty who are attendees. We may want to train our trainers so the people who are teaching our attendees know exactly what we want them to teach and so we have a unified teaching method. And we want to consider pilot testing this. Maybe we pilot test with some of our medical students so we can practice, we have all the models we need. Do we understand our handouts make sense? All right. So the last step and the step that feeds into iterative versions of our curriculum is evaluation and feedback. And these are a huge part of curriculum development and one that unfortunately we can only broadly discuss in the time we have today. Once your curriculum has been implemented, you want to measure how effective it was. This is going to include both assessment of individual performance and other aspects of the curriculum and evaluation of the program itself to include reviewing and analyzing the content of those assessments. There are multiple frameworks and theories used in program evaluation. The Thomas text describes a fairly linear approach and Kirkpatrick's framework is another and others might use complexity or systems theories to try and look at other aspects of the curriculum and how they might influence your outcomes or be influenced by your learners and environment. We're going to focus less on the theories and on the steps and look more at the broad concepts that should be understood for evaluation. Just as a terminology, feedback includes reporting back the findings of evaluations and in the moment reflections on individual and curricular performance. So the information that you gather in your evaluation will reflect who will use the information and how they intend to use it. Feedback can be arrayed on two axes, formative and summative, individual and programmatic, and we've placed them here with an example of each as they intersect in the quadrants. Formative feedback focuses on identifying areas for improvement for the purpose of making specific suggestions on what and how to improve. This might be applied to both individual performance or to areas of the curriculum based on pilot testing, learner feedback surveys, or meetings between curriculum coordinators and learners to discuss the program. Summative individual assessments are judgments of final performance, and those include knowledge exams, OPSCEs, or other tools. These judgments are used to support verification of individual achievement, motivating individuals to maintain or improve their performance for grades and certification, and also for promotion. Summative program evaluation is similarly a judgment of performance and is used to support arguments for the success or efficacy of a program, for allocation of resources, for motivation or recruitment of faculty and learners to join a successful program. It can be used for satisfying outside requirements, again, such as accrediting bodies, or it can support plans for dissemination of the curriculum, including publication and for presentations. The questions you ask in evaluation are going to be informed by the outcomes that you selected during your problem identification and the goals and objectives that are used to achieve those outcomes. 
you can evaluate multiple aspects of a curriculum, including subcomponents and different levels of outcome, as in Kirkpatrick, to support your evaluation decisions. But there are many ways that implementation is going to influence your evaluation, and that will limit the conclusions that you can draw from your assessment. If your rollout is a single group and you're planning on doing pre or post testing, these can reflect perceptions or elicit feedback on a curriculum. But without a control group, you can't truly demonstrate that any learner accomplishments are due to your effort and not due to random effects or maturation or other processes outside of what you're doing. You can try quasi-experimental designs, and that would be with control groups but not randomized. And that will localize some effects to the curriculum itself but it won't control for non-random differences between your groups. In some cases, leaving out a control group also isn't polit politically or ethically feasible in your system. And so we come up with schemes where uh, group A is taught and group B doesn't, uh, is only tested and then they will cross over or group A will, or group B will get the curriculum at a later date. But again, that's not always feasible. Truly randomized designs, like randomized clinical goal, you know, essentially educational trials, where both you have a control group and the groups are truly randomized, can control for maturation effects from learning from your tests and for selection bias. But in addition to denying some learners access to your curriculum is very time and very resource intensive. And so we're not always able to truly prove that a large curriculum or intervention is, uh, is having the effects that we might want to try and demonstrate. Looking more simply, we can use Kirkpatrick and ask other questions. It might be something as simple as, did they like the curriculum? Did they retain information or demonstrate skills? Did they perform differently after training? Or was there a measurable change made in the intended outcome? And all of that will be limited by, again, how you roll out your curriculum and how you plan for evaluation. To make those assessments, there's a number of tools available and each of them have relative strengths as far as assessing cognitive, affective, and psychomotor domains. Some tools will be better suited based upon logistical measures, the training required for implementation, or limitations of the data being collected to provide conclusions. And your selection and use of evaluation methods is going to be subject to how they fit into your validity argument. And validity is a topic that we really can only reference here. But to summarize it, you want to demonstrate that the intervention made in your curriculum supports the change that you're looking for, both in your methods and in content, and that then the tool you use to measure is appropriate for that measurement. If you end up developing your own tools for evaluation, there are frameworks for validity that will guide you in creating an argument for their use. And these frameworks are also important if you're adapting an existing tool to show that it's appropriate in the context you've chosen. And this is a common challenge when I'm reviewing papers is that people select a tool that doesn't have a good validity argument for the setting they're using it. Uh, and I think that's an easy way to one, uh, weaken your paper, or it's a great opportunity to get more out of the research or the curriculum development you're doing is gathering that evidence and demonstrating that not only do I know what I'm doing, but I know why I'm doing it. And therefore, maybe you should trust the conclusions I've come to. So for our evaluation, uh, it may be helpful to consider a number of areas to evaluate. Uh, we can, might look at self-assessment surveys. We might directly observe faculty skills. But we might also look at resident surveys after the fact on the quality of their supervision or the availability of supervision. And we can even look at department level effects, such as are we getting the increased RVUs from documented and appropriate supervision? After this evaluation, all of these points of information can then inform a new general needs assessment. Have we changed the current process adequately such that we can look at a new problem? Or do we need to change the outcome that we're measuring while we keep working at our initial problem? And this feeds into the iterative process of curriculum development. Okay, so that was our whirlwind tour through the current model of curriculum development. For many of our products as educators, this whole project process can be done fairly informally. There's really no need to go deep into the uh, theories behind this, but just think about these processes as you do it. But 
we want to make sure that we do do these steps to ensure successful implementation of our curriculum. Outside of these six steps, though, there is a seventh unwritten step in the process. And that is dissemination. There are many reasons you may want to disseminate your work and why scholarship is important. But we are all busy people. It's also important to think about make, working smart and making your efforts count twice. And how do I turn this whole process into something that I can publish? So we also want to highlight the next five minutes some tips to turn this entire process into a publication or scholarly product. So first, plan with end product in mind. Know where you are going. Where could you publish this curriculum and what are their standards and requirements? Take a look around and do that early in the process and use those requirements to help you in your show planning. You could say submit your entire curriculum to something like Meta Portal, or you could submit part of your curriculum Say your innovation in bed that teaching to a journal like academic EM education and training. Depending on what you're submitting, you, either one might be more appropriate. But you have to look through the criteria before to get a sense of what their expectations are in what you're submitting. Also, take an opportunity to look at what they published before and what those publications and what those published those papers have included in their write-up. That might help you guide what you do up front. So, just to reinforce the importance of knowing where you're going and following a framework and adapt your curriculum, this is from the Meta Portal submission website. This is their standards for submission as adapted from Glassic's criteria for scholarship. And to think this through, first, they want clear goals that the authors clearly stated the educational objectives. This is where it's important that you really have thought through your educational objectives and written clear objectives. They want adequate preparation, i.e., does the author use his prior work to inform their work? This is your targeted needs assessment, including a literature review and a review to see if a similar, uh, similar curriculum has been published before. They want appropriate methods, aka did you select the correct educational strategies? Significant results, did you think about your evaluation? And effective presentation and reflective critique. You also, step two, you wanna recruit help. The development and implementation of a curriculum is hard enough and takes a lot of your time. You don't want to do it alone. Recruiting someone, when recruiting someone, consider someone who's experienced in medical education research. A lot of these things happen in parallel process. And in order to make a scholarly product, you want to think early about your research. So if your evaluation plan today includes some type of pre-assessment, you need to know this early and get someone to help you implement this early. You also want someone with experience doing this type of work so you do it correctly and you don't set yourself up for failure by having inappropriate evaluations to match your educational outcomes. Step, tip three is make sure that all the parts fit. Make sure that your objectives make sense with your educational modalities and the validation methods you choose. Just like with basic science research, your question should fit your methods which should match your results you report. This is the same. This is again, why it's so important to think about when you write your objectives and to be intentional with this part. If your objectives are demonstrate successful placement of a peripheral IV, then you cannot just report a Likert scale of participant satisfaction with the workshop that is bound to get rejected by meta portal or a similar repertoire of curricula. And four, publisher needs assessment. Really, this is to say, your curriculum alone is not the only publishable part of your work. There are multiple components of your curriculum or curricular adjacent work that are suitable for publication. Say you want to design a curriculum to improve the safety of e-discharge process, your needs assessment may be a national survey about how this is currently being taught at EM, EM residency programs across the country. That in and of itself might be worthy of dissemination. Again, this may take a lot of your time, and again, why you might need to recruit help in the process, but there's no need to do this before you implement your curriculum. It can be done in parallel processing, because again, you may be piloting your curriculum and doing other things, so just get people involved early. And also, in doing your work, you may identify interesting questions that may be outside your wheelhouse entirely, but may be interesting product to be a part of. And this may when you want to identify someone else in your department or a friend that may want to get involved in this work that you can be peripherally involved in. And finally, document what you do and why you do it. Along the way, you will make lots of decisions. 
during your needs assessment, you may interview content experts about the content and methods used, or you may pilot your curriculum and go through several rounds of implementation, making changes along the way through each of these iterations. Keep track of the changes you make and why you make them. This will be important to report when you're publishing your entire curriculum and may be asked for from the reviewers. So just to summarize where we've been, we want um, making a curriculum, you want to perform a thoughtful needs assessment. You want to create smart objectives. You want to match the educational strategy you're using to the main you're targeting. You want to balance your objectives, methods, and your evaluation tools. And you want to plan for scholarship early to make your work count twice. So with that, Jordan, I to thank you and open up to anyone in the audience for questions, if you have any. Muted. <laughs> We've blown you all away, and that's okay. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Sorry. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. So, um, you know, I think this is fantastic. I think it can be really daunting for a junior faculty member with no research expertise. Um, to sort of approach looking at making their project publishable. What would you recommend for those people who may not have a great resource for mentorship in-house? Great, ah, that's a great question. I would say first, when thinking about curriculum development, I think a lot of people get intimidated by how many steps there are and it can seem too scholarly and it almost impairs their work. Doing a curriculum for your own institution or for your own, for your own needs, it doesn't need to be so scholarly, it can be practical. But when doing it in a scholarly way, there are a lot of resources that exist. We hope this may be one of them, but there are great resources out there. Even CORD has great connections. The Merck program through CORD can help you think about medical education research. But also just going through MedEd Portal, and we keep bringing that up, because it is one of the biggest repositories of curricular development, it can give you a lot of insight into what they're looking for. That's great. Uh, there's a question from Thomas uh, about uh, what would the, the expectation of the turnaround time from development to publication? Of development of curriculum to publication? I think it, very, it varies what you're going for. I think if you're going to publish a curriculum, it is very helpful to have several iterations of that. One, you have a larger N of learners that you can assess to add to your program evaluation. It's a multiple rounds you can add to your, your evaluation but also it gives you several rounds to implement it. And so if you say we're going to publish this meta portal, you would want to have done it a few times. And so you can have a long lag from implementation to publication. If it's a cool new innovation, you're gonna publish in one of the EM journals about an innovative educational modality, you may wanna publish that sooner. One, to disseminate it to your colleagues, because they may wanna use it, but also because it's new innovative, you wanna get it out there, be so enough beats you to the punch. Uh, and I, I see your follow-up question there, Thomas. Uh, from personal experience, I have a very, very simple heart sounds um, auscultation project that I'll tell you I'm writing up now, but we conceived of the project four years ago. And that sounds like a nightmare, and yet I look at the, pro the development progress and process, and I don't know that I could have done it all that much faster. Uh, that being said, you know, there are quicker talks and kind of workshops that you can plot out and go from the planning to the curriculum itself to the publication, you know, in the course of a year. Uh, and so one of our uh, former fellows, Alicia Brown, who I think is on the line still here, um, did a similar project uh, using a hackathon at our program um, evaluation meeting at the end of the year. And then Gia Coleman has a question. Um, so how could you use this to create a curriculum for harder to measure things, such as cognitive processes and simulation to create practice patterns? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to Bjorn. Simple question for you. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that the challenge in trying to measure more um, more complicated things like cognitive processes 
is part of the whole validity argument that I got to, I sort of alluded to. And the difficulty is that even in um, educational or cognitive psychology, I think we have a hard time finding valid measures for these processes anyway. And that is a strong limitation in developing curriculum to demonstrate real effects of any curriculum. And so I, I'm kind of, I have the same sort of interests as you do right now in my fellowship is trying to find real ways to actually assess these. And there's really cool things people are doing with watching um, video from the perspective of a clinician and then either having them talk aloud while they're doing something or having them watch a video of themselves performing actions. And that way we try and get at RVs, you know, their real cognitive processes. But I'll tell you, even though those are getting published right now and they are super cool to think about and to read, there are a lot of um, counter arguments that would say that after the fact discussion of our reasoning may not actually reflect our cognitive processes. And so, you know, they are definitely harder and I don't want to leave you with a tautology such as they're harder because they're harder. Um, but that's the state of my knowledge right now. <laughs> I, I will, well, let me wrap that back up though with one of the things that is nice for this framework is that it can be used at any scale. And you can go through these steps for a 30 minute talk, like the one that we're giving today, or you can use these same steps for a whole residency curriculum that encompasses three or four years and all the subdomains of that entire curriculum. As the model works, it's blind to the scope of your project. And then just so everybody knows, all of these talks are recorded and archived on the CORD website. So if you've missed anything or you want to see this again or you want to see the Curriculum 101 again, please check out the CORD website. All of them are um, archived right there and they're easy to access. They're right on the CORD website. Cool. Any other okay. thoughts? Thanks both for coming and presenting. This was amazing. Great. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Tonya. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks.